Jesus said to the crowds, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats his bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. The Jews quarreled among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? He said to them, amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has life eternal and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as a living father sent me and I have life because of the father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is a bread that came down from heaven. Unlike your ancestors who ate and still died, whoever eats this bread will live forever. Hello and welcome to Closer Walk Catholic Communications. I'm Father By, your host. I'm glad that you can join us. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you will not have life eternal. This man's crazy. He's absolutely crazy. You want to, you want to eat my flesh? You want me to eat your flesh and drink your blood? And we're not going to die? What happens when we eat all of you and you're dead? Now, seriously, you have to understand what this sounded like to the Jews that he was preaching. First of all, you have life eternal. Come on, man. Moses died. Abraham died. Elijah died. People die. It's what happens, okay? What do you mean we're not going to die? You know, they were observing Jews. Observing Jews have strict dietary laws. So, you know, I mean, they don't, they don't warm up a bowl of milk in something that they cook something that beef, beef was in because it's like cooking the, the calf in the mother's milk. I mean, these dietary, now you're telling me to eat your, eat your flesh, drink your blood? This was, I, they didn't know what was going on. I mean, they, they really thought he was a crackpot. You know, maybe we've seen him do some good things. This guy's nuts. He's talking about eating the flesh and drinking his blood. Now we know. But for the Jews who didn't understand this, I get it. I didn't understand. I, mean, I wouldn't understand that either. People living forever. Ever. People don't live forever, okay? They die. Go to the cemetery. None of us getting out of here alive. What are you talking about? I mean, I, I eat, eat my flesh. It, it was all very confusing. John chapter 6 is, if, if anyone wants to know about whether or not you Catholics really believe in the real presence that that little wafer is really Jesus, Read John chapter 6. Any, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall not have life eternal. How do you interpret that? How do you interpret that? When Jesus at the Last Supper said, Take and eat, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. Take and drink. This is my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, which will be shed for you. Didn't say, this is my body if you think it's my body. This is my body if you feel like it's my body. 
This is my body. If you want it to be my body, this is. This is my body. This is my blood. So obviously for the Jews, you know, and, and even his disciples were saying, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you'll not have life eternal. Oh, okay. The Last Supper. That's what you're talking about. That's what we understand now. We didn't know what you were talking about before. Now, now we get it. Now we get it. Live forever, destroy this temple, in three days I'll rebuild it. Huh? Took him 100 years. Hey, three days, he was going to live forever. He was going to rise from the dead. All this stuff is very, very key to who we are as Catholics. Now, put this hat on, okay? Take a bunch of second graders who you're giving First Communion to and try and explain to them how it really does become the body and blood of Jesus. Because when we practice, they gave us one of those little wafers, and then when we went to communion, it didn't taste any different. They let us take a sip of wine. It didn't taste any different. What are you talking about? Try this. Okay, second graders, Father wants to explain to you transubstantiation. You know, first of all, you don't need to spell it, you just need to understand it. What do you mean, transubstantiation? Well, it means the matter and the form remain the same, but the essence has changed. Oh, good, thanks, Father, we got it now. The matter and form, what are you talking about? Matter, form, essence. Well, you know, when we talk about matter and form, we're talking about externals. When we're talking about essence, we're talking about internals. And this is the example I use, and I use it for the kids, and I know they don't really get it, but I'm really using it on their mom and dad because I'm trying to jack them up about making sure you go to church, okay? But, you know, I tell this example of, of what it means. I said, well, you know, a long time ago, when your mom and daddy found out they were going to have a baby, they were so excited. They're going to have a baby, and that was you. And so all of a sudden, they found they were, they were going to have a baby, then mom started to change, you know. You started growing inside mommy and everything like that, and so mommy started to, to, to get bigger and everything, and, you know, and she started to have a backache, and her feet started to hurt, and, you know, and she got out of breath because you were growing inside of her, and she was so big, and this, that, and the other. Now I said, Daddy, Daddy should have been just the same. Daddy shouldn't have gained 35 pounds while they were waiting for you to be born, okay? I said, on the outside, Mommy did all the work. Mommy went through all that stuff, you know, but Dad, on, on the other hand, Dad shouldn't have gained that weight. And so, anyway, the day comes when you're ready to be born. Well, Mommy can hardly walk and we need to put her in a wheelchair and we need to bring her to the delivery room and everything like that, you know, and they make Mommy get undressed and they put a gown on her so that you can be born. Dad, in the meantime, walks in in his, in his blue jeans and his sneakers and his, you know, his golf shirt. He's... And, Everything's just the same for dad. And all of a sudden, you start being born, and mom goes through all these different things, and you know, it's a big process, and sometimes it's very painful, and finally you come. Now, mom has been through a lot, but dad hadn't changed on the outside. Mom's done all the changing, but when the doctor walked up to your daddy and put you in your daddy's hand and said, this is your little boy, or this is your little girl, guess what? Daddy was forever changed. On the outside, nothing changed. But on the inside, the first time he heard that this is your little boy or this is your little girl, Daddy was forever changed. He would never be the same because now he wasn't just some guy. He was your daddy. Now, Mom loves you just as much, but... She went through a lot of physical changes. Daddy didn't go through any, but he was forever different. I said, boys and girls, I'm trying to explain 
the, the, the Eucharist that way, what transubstantiation means. But when you talk about this, then we get back to what we've been talking about for the last couple weeks in our program, the power of the Holy Spirit. Whether or not God is still involved in the world, whether or not God still takes part in the things that we do. You know, and, and if God is active in the world, then, then how's God's manifest? God's manifest through the Holy Spirit. You know, God's, uh, the Father's a creator. The Son came and we killed him. He promised us the Holy Spirit, the paraclete, to be with us till the end of time. Do you believe that that really exists? If, if the Holy Spirit really exists, then do you believe what he, what he promised? Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall not have life eternal. All right, well, how does it do it? By the power of the Holy Spirit. The words and the actions of the priest and then the power of the Holy Spirit turns this ordinary bread and wine into the body and blood of Jesus. And it's not a physical change. The matter and form, they remain the same. The essence is different. Well, then, I, that accounts for a whole bunch of stuff. Why are Catholics so different? Well, why do you genuflect in a Catholic church? Because you got nice stained glass? No. You genuflect because Jesus is present. Why do you go into a Catholic church and you're supposed to be quiet and prayerful and reverent and not visiting with everybody and their brother? Why? Because you're in the presence of Jesus. Okay? Well, if, if, if Jesus, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should enter under my roof, only say the word and my soul shall be healed. God's coming to your house. You're going to clean up a little bit? You leave the house messy and dirty? Are you going to walk up to invite Jesus under your roof with serious sin on your soul? You have to be in the state of sanctifying grace. You can't have serious sin on your soul and validly receive the sacraments. You've got to be married according to the laws of the church. You can't have any mortal sins on your soul to validly re receive the Eucharist. It's a whole understanding. And so it's not a question, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, it's not a question to see whether or not I can break into a Catholic church and get some of those, okay? It's not the point. It's understanding what it means to be worthy to receive Jesus, body and blood, soul and divinity, and in receiving Jesus, body and blood, soul and divinity. How does that prepare us? for everlasting life. We're going to talk more about it when we come back. Stay with us. Hi, I'm Father Jeff Bay from Close to Walk Catholic Communications. Thank you for being here today, and a special thanks for the support that you give us. First of all, your prayerful support we so desperately need, and also your financial support. We are donor-driven, and that is what keeps us on the air today. As you well know, the truth is in great demand and in very short supply, and mainstream media is not going to bring you the truth of the Gospels of our Lord Jesus Christ because that's not socially acceptable and it's not politically correct. Certainly we all realize that when this life journey is over, we don't stand before the Supreme Court, we stand before the throne of God. Therefore, with great clarity and great charity, to pronounce the truth of the Gospel is important. Your prayers, your financial support, enables us to do that. So we thank you, and may God bring you closer in your walk with the Lord each day. God bless you. Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of Son of Man and drink His blood, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood 
is True Drink. Hello and welcome back to Closer Walk. I'm Father Bayer, your host, and we're glad you can join us. One of the things that has been very, very uh, confusing for a lot of people and, and oftentimes painful is when people live their lives and they try to pass on their faith to the next generation, name of their own children, and all of a sudden, you know, these children, no, church is boring, no, we don't go, we, you know, it, it's not this, it's not that. And, and then now all of a sudden they, they, they find another Yay Jesus Church and they're going on Wednesday nights and they're going on Sunday mornings, they're going on Sunday nights, and it's like, what have they missed? What have we missed? I had a, and this happened oftentimes when I was out in the country. You know, we were a sugarcane area, and unless you got an education and it's something to do with sugarcane, there really wasn't a job market out in the country. And a lot of times their children left, they went to college, they moved to the city, they got new jobs, and oftentimes they got new religions. And one of the mothers who was particularly upset by that, it was Mother's Day coming up, and and he called and said, hey, it's Mother's Day, I'm coming, what do you want for Mother's Day? He said, the only thing I want you to do is go to Mass with me. The only thing I want you to do is go to Mass. So he did, he came and he went to Mass, and after Mass, they're up on the right-hand side of the sanctuary where the tabernacle was, and he said, son, how can you leave Jesus in the Eucharist for that new church? And he looked at the Eucharist, he said, Mom, I never had a hard time believing Jesus uh, was in the Eucharist. But he turned to the congregation, he said, that's where I could never find Jesus. That's a pretty stunning, stunning accusation. And that is, and, and, and I ask you, how many of us go realizing that I have an encounter, I have the opportunity to receive the living God who comes into me. Into me. And he goes with me to work that day, he goes with me wherever I go, God's in me. How many of us believe that? I'm gonna question that because, you know, given communion out for the last 40 years, it's amazing how disconnected some people are. Hey, it's your turn now, because they're talking to someone coming up the aisle, you know, that, that sort of thing. And uh, it's really, really concerning that a lot of people don't understand this opportunity for an encounter with the living God. And the other thing is, is that when they, when they do that, you know, and I think, I, I think there's validity. I mean, how many Christians have you found in parking lots in, in churches, Catholic or otherwise, okay? They're in a hurry to get out, you know. They're not really real Christian in the parking lot, I promise you. But the understanding is this, that if for the people who say they believe and say they receive and say that Christ is in them, if that makes no difference, then why go? You know what? You go to church every Sunday. Not me. I party Saturday night. I sleep late. I ain't been to church in years. And guess what? We get to the office Monday morning, and your hatred is, your prejudice, your impatience, your lack of charity is no different from mine. We're the same person. So that Jesus must not be doing you a whole lot of good if you go in there every week to get one. Hey, fair enough. It's an honest criticism. But the other thing is, is oftentimes we don't, when our children engage, oh, we have communion at my new church. Well, good. Well, what do you believe? It's Jesus. Yeah, it's Jesus. Is that what they tell you? Yeah, yeah, it's Jesus. They tell us. It's Jesus. And, and look, in that church, anybody can come. Doesn't matter. We don't have all the rules like, 
like the Catholic Church does. Just anybody can come. So when they tell you, yeah, it's, it's really G, oh yeah, we got little little cups with wine in it, you know, or grape juice, and we got little wafers or little biscuit type of things. Well, good. And, and they tell you it's really Jesus. Yeah. What do they do with the leftovers? Huh? What do they do with the leftovers? I don't know why. Well, if it's really Jesus, do they throw away what they don't use? Do they put it back in the box? They put it back in the bottle? Does anyone genuflect in front of it if it's really Jesus? The understanding. And I go back to you, Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. The same one who was at the last supper who said, you know, take this and eat, for this is my body, take this and drink. This is my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. That's the church. And that's what we teach. And it's not just about we've, you know, got the best name to explain it, transubstantiation. It's about the reality of doing and continuing what uh, our Lord says in John chapter 6, that it's necessary for us to receive the body and blood in order for us to gain everlasting life. And so therefore, when we casually walk away, we casually walk away because, you know, they got a priest, I can't understand a word, I don't even know where he's from. He's dark in color, and I can't understand a word he says, okay? So you're going to walk away from an opportunity to have Jesus come to you, body and blood, soul and divinity, just because someone goes on in some language that you're not even really familiar with. And you're going to walk away from Jesus. And what do you believe? Well, I don't like that priest. He's always asking about money. Well, what do you believe? Hey, look. You think I'm going to a Catholic church? All those perverts? You been? You read the paper about all those child molesters? As if I'm going there. What do you believe? What do you believe? Are there sinners in the church? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. There always has been. We have a great tradition of, of saints. And we have a great tradition of sinners. And as long as our Lord has left the church in human hands... I don't think that's going to change. We certainly want to diminish the sinners, but we've always had saints and sinners in the church. The question is, is our basic belief. Do we accept John chapter 6? And is it necessary to receive Jesus, body and blood, soul and divinity, in order for us to gain everlasting life? A lot of people, you know, I, I used to love the bumper sticker, you know, God said it, I believe it, that settles it. It's amazing for people who like to take the scriptures very literally, and so that's why, well, Brother Bahe, I can't call you father because the Bible says, call no man father, call no man teacher, call no man rabbi. You know, so I got to call you brother. Well, they don't understand, but anyway, it's, it's another story. They're very literal with that. But when John chapter 6 says, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you shall not have life eternal. What do you do with that? How necessary is that in our belief system? And that's what we celebrate on this Corpus Christi Sunday. We celebrate the fact that it truly is Jesus body and blood, soul and divinity. And, I, you know, and, and I'm going to get off on, on, on one of my, my little tears. It amazes me the way some people act in church. You walk into a room and Jesus is in that room and you're going to be ignoring him completely and cutting up and carrying on. Do you realize how many few places we have where we can be quiet and feel the presence of God. That's what our churches ought to be. That's why we go there. 
And you know what? People make this, this statement. God doesn't care what you wear as long as you show up. Good. Take that attitude to the next banquet you go to. Take that attitude to the next wedding that you go to. Bring your children out of the yard in flip-flops and dirty t-shirts smelling like a little ragazzi and bring them to the, the next party you have with the family, okay? We never let them go there. We're scared of what other people might think. You walked into this wedding and those children stunk. They hadn't even bathed. They were in flip-flops. They came to a wedding just like that. We never do that but it's good enough for God. Let me tell you something. God's got so much stuff going on in the world. Your flip-flops and gym shorts don't matter to God. What, what worries me is, does it matter to you? Does it matter to you? Why don't you, why don't you go to, those same, to your prom in those same flip-flops and shorts? Why don't you go to your graduation day in those same flip-flops and shorts? Why don't you get married looking like that? Well, not be embarrassed. But you're not embarrassed to present yourself to, to God? Does God love you? Absolutely. Do you love God enough to show Him the same amount of respect when you go to worship Him as you do when you go to celebrate someone else's wedding because we have a very nice reception afterwards? I'm just saying, have I gotten to that point where I'm an old fart? Yeah, I know. Oh, you know, that's the reason why, you know, you, you, you preach drive away young people. Yeah, because, you know, you, you, you about all the wrong things. I got news for you. Those of you who say anything is good enough from God and will accept anything our children do, and we're going to back them and we're going to love them, and just as long as they do it, we act like we love them. For God's sakes, for people who say they want the very best for your children, Quit saying, at least they're here. At least they got married. At least they're happy. When you really love them, give them the very best. And you do that by showing the very best that we all owe to God. We thank you for being with us. May each day bring you close in your walk with the Lord. God bless you.